It's such an honor to be with all of you. There is so much to talk about. And what an honor it is also to represent independent media here. Now, I have met a lot of people today. Uh, we did a session this morning, and then I've spoken to a lot of old and young uh, people here who are deeply committed to bringing out the truth. So I know some people know Democracy Now!, others haven't heard of it, and I consider that a great challenge, and I'm thrilled that I hope Democracy Now!, a daily grassroots global news hour, will also be an invitation to believe that media can be a path to the truth. I originally come from Pacifica Radio, which was founded more than 60 years ago in Berkeley, California, 1949, by a war resistor. Um, he resisted World War II named Lou Hill, who said there's got to be a media outlet that's not run by corporations that profit from war, but run by journalists and artists. And that's how Pacifica Radio was born. The first station, KPFA in Berkeley. Ten years later in Los Angeles, 1959, KPFK. My station in New York City, WBAI Radio, in 1960. In Washington, D.C., not far from here, 89.3 FM. Every morning you'll hear Democracy Now! live at 8. Uh, that's WPFW, Jazz and Justice Radio. And in 1970, KPFT went on the air in Houston, Texas, 48 years ago, in the spring. It was on the air for a few weeks, and then the Ku Klux Klan blew it up. They strapped dynamite to the base of the transmitter and blew it to smithereens. KPFT got back on their feet, rebuilt the transmitter, they went back on the air, and the Klan strapped 15 times the dynamite to the base of the transmitter and blew it up again. They said it was their proudest act. Now, it took months for KPFT, Pacifica Radio, and the Petro Metro to get back on their feet. But when they did January of 1971, all the media was there. And since that time, 48 years later, well, then 47, they have been broadcasting. Now, I can't remember which member of the Klan said it was their proudest act, the exalted Cyclops or the Grand Dragon, because I often confuse their titles. But I think I understand why he said what he did, because he understood how dangerous independent media is. Dangerous because it allows people to speak for themselves. And when you hear someone speaking from their own experience, whether it is a Palestinian child, and you may have heard the news over the last 24 hours, it's hardly covered in the United States, but what's happened in Gaza over land day, I believe 15, 17 people killed as the Palestinians protesting. But whether it's a Palestinian child or an Israeli grandmother, whether it is an uncle in Afghanistan or an aunt in Iraq, when you hear someone describing their own experience, it breaks down caricatures and stereotypes that fuel the hate groups. Now, I'm not saying you'll agree with what you hear. I mean, Someone will say, it sounds like my mother, my aunt, my uncle. How often do we even agree with our family members? But you begin to understand where they're coming from. And that understanding is the beginning of peace. I think the media can be the greatest force for peace on Earth. Instead, all too often, it's wielded as a weapon of war which is why it's so important that we take the media back. There's nothing more important. How does the rest of the world come to understand us? It must be through something other than a corporate lens brought to you by the weapons manufacturers and the insurance industry and the oil, gas, and coal companies. And how does 
do you understand the rest of the world? It must be through something other than a corporate lens, which is where independent media comes in. Democracy Now! brought to you by the listeners, the viewers, the readers, people around the globe at democracynow.org who are deeply committed to hearing the truth, or I should say truths, hearing people describing their own experiences. And I really do think that, that those views, for example, go back to the US invasion of Iraq in March 19th, March 20th, 2003. And the role that the media plays, as Noam Chomsky says, the media manufactures consent for war. I think back to February 5th, 2003, the day then General Colin Powell, the Secretary of State, gave that push for war at the United Nations, which was the nail in the coffin for so many. And he said, yes, the evidence is in, there are WMD. Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. He would later say that this speech that he gave was a blot on his career, that he had been given wrong information by, among others, the person sitting right behind him in that speech, George Tenet, the head of the CIA. But at that time, that's the argument Secretary of State Colin Powell made. And this was the speech that convinced so many, because he dragged his feet on war. He wasn't like Cheney. He wasn't like Bush. And when he said the evidence was in, that convinced many. Now, I recently was on a panel at the University of Albany, and Bob Schieffer was the moderator, you know, from CBS, the evening news, and Sunday morning. He recently retired. And I talked about the failure of the press at that time that act as a conveyor belt for the lies of, the, at the time, the Bush administration. You know, that was the critical period. The group FAIR in New York, Fairness and Accuracy and Reporting, did a study of the four major nightly newscasts, the two weeks around Powell's address. You know, Government officials can say anything they want, but you need a media that brings out the full diversity of opinion. So what did they do at that time? They looked at the four nightly newscasts, ABC World News Tonight, CBS Evening News, NBC Nightly News, and the PBS NewsHour. In that two-week period around Powell's speech, they had 393 interviews around war. Guess how many were with anti-war leaders? Now remember, this was at a time when half the population was for war, half against. So it should be sort of evenly divided. Of the 393 interviews around war, or clips in the nightly news around war, only three were with anti-war leaders, three of almost 400, which is why I don't talk about the mainstream media. That's not mainstream. They weren't representing the mainstream. This was an extremist media beating the drums for war. You know, sadly, we talk about other countries and their propaganda. In the United States, we don't have state media. But if we had state media, how would it be any different? That's what the media did at that time. And it was unacceptable. So I raised this with Bob Schieffer. And Bob, who prides himself on you know, civil discussion, said, Amy, I really have to beg to differ with you. And you know, he was one of the main players in the media at that time. And I said, Bob, did I get it wrong? Did you yourself have more than three interviews around war? And was this study wrong? And he said, no. I didn't say that. So I said, so what is your difference with what I have just pointed out? And he said, do you mean to say that if we could get Secretary of State Colin Powell on, we should be bringing on a peace activist? And I said, but of course. That's what the media is for, to bring out the voices of everyone. And I said, I bet there's no one more than Secretary Powell himself who would have wanted that? 
who would have wanted this information to be brought out because he said he was given the wrong information. We play a critical role in society. Journalists, the fourth estate, we are not a party to the parties, whether it's the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, we are apart from those parties. And it's absolutely critical that we be able to play that role. Why it is so unacceptable when the current president of the United States, President Donald Trump, talks about the media as the enemy of the American people. No, that is not acceptable. Media is essential to the functioning of a democratic society. And I truly think that being there as a forum for people to express their diverse views, it's dissent that will save us. You know, we are now moving in this weekend into next week, the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. Many will gather in Memphis where he was gunned down. April 4th, 1968. Democracy Now! Tune In Every Day will be bringing you voices from Memphis, of the people who organized with him. You know what he was doing in Memphis. He was organizing with sanitation workers who were simply trying to organize a local union of AFSCME, the American Federation of State County Municipal Employees, when he was gunned down. So, a year to the day before he was killed, on April 4th, 1967, he was giving a speech in New York at the Riverside Church. It was a speech that many, even in his inner circle, said, Martin, don't give this speech. He was making his pronouncement publicly, speaking against the war in Vietnam. And they were telling him, don't do this, Martin. They said, you have the President of the United States, President Johnson, wrapped around your finger, the most powerful person on Earth. You got him to sign the Voting Rights Act. You got him to sign the Civil Rights Act. This war is not your war. And he said, no. He saw all of these issues as interconnected. He talked about the triple threat, the threats of militarism, materialism, and racism. He talked about poverty. He was leading a poor people's march on Washington. And he spoke out. And he said in that speech, my country, the country he loved, is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. After that speech, and especially important for young people to hear this, you think, well, it was easy for Dr. King to say anything because he was, you know, he was revered. He was a Nobel Peace Prize winner. It's harder for us as young people to express views like this. Think again. After Dr. King gave that speech, he was vilified by the corporate media, by the Washington Post, by Life Magazine, by the networks. They said, and I have the Life Magazine issue where they wrote their editorial. These newspapers and magazines said he had done a disservice to his cause, his country, and his people. They said his speech sounded like a script out of Radio Hanoi because he called for the U.S. military to pull out of Vietnam. The man was a prophet. And even as they attacked him, he doubled down. He spoke out even more fiercely. Until that day, April 4th, 1968, when he was gunned down in Memphis, Tennessee. This is so important for us to understand 50 years later, and to understand <clears throat> that Dr. King, to the end, was a leader of movements. And it's movements that will save us even today. In fact, it was Dr. King's granddaughter, Yolanda, how old, 9, 10, 11 years old, who spoke at the anti-gun violence march last weekend in Washington, D.C. But let's start right after Trump was elected, the day after his inauguration, while many made a lot out of the fact that 
his inaugural crowd was smaller than President Obama's nine years earlier. You just had to look one day after Trump's inaugural inauguration to see three times the number of people at his inauguration pouring out onto the mall, the women and their allies who marched not only in Washington, D.C., but all over the country for peace. And then it wasn't days after, spontaneously, people raced to airports around the country challenging Trump's Muslim ban. All over the country, the president immediately wanted to know who was paying them because he was speaking from his own experience. Why would you do something if you weren't being given money? But that, of course, wasn't the case. This was a spontaneous uprising across the country of people, Muslim and non-Muslim, who were saying, we represent the best of America. We will protect this country. <clears throat> And then you have the judiciary, um, the judges across the country who were also challenging President Trump's Muslim ban. You had the Washington state judge. You had the federal judge in Hawaii. Um, President Trump calling them so-called judges. And his attorney general, Jeff Sessions, who is the head of the Justice Department in this country in reference to the federal judge in Hawaii was speaking on a right-wing radio talk show and said, how is it possible that a man on an island in the Pacific can stop the president of the United States? It's called the co-equal branches of government. And I think we're all right now engaged in a remarkable civics lesson about the power of government and the co-equal branches of government when they work. So we are in a historic place. We came in last night to Baltimore and immediately went to where Frederick Douglass went when he was a child. He came to Baltimore. You know the uh, famous abolitionist, the most famous abolitionist in this country fought slavery because he himself had been enslaved as a youth and a teenager on the eastern shore of Maryland by a man named Ed Covey, who was a slave owner, had a plantation. He was known as the slave breaker. And Frederick Douglass, it might not surprise you to know, was a troublesome slave. And that's who was handed over to Covey. Douglas fought back, escaped, went north to New York, and then went on from there. But he founded a newspaper called the North Star Newspaper. He took refuge in a printing press building in New York that was owned by a man, a free black man named David Ruggles. And I always thought it was so interesting. Ruggles had this printing press. press. Frederick Douglass founded the North Star Newspaper. These men saw media as their form of liberation. Yes, I really do think an independent, an independent press is what can save us. And how important it is that every community be involved in framing your own experience with a media that you are a part of. Last weekend, when we covered the anti-gun violence march in Washington. How amazing it was to see of the 17 speakers, 17 for the 17 lives lost on Valentine's Day at the massacre in Parkland, Florida, at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. These remarkable young people who the NRA never counted on. They've always relied on the pain and the agony of these slaughters to silence families who are in mourning to just get past the news cycle so that when people started to speak out, the media wouldn't be interested anymore. But do you know these young people were debating gun control even under the desks and in the closets as they waited? <laughs> 
as they protected each other and their teachers protected them against the gunmen in Parkland. In fact, that day, right before the shooter opened fire, their AP government teacher was teaching them about these special interests like the NRA. And so you had just three days later in Fort Lauderdale, the young, remarkable 18-year-old Emma Gonzalez, who stood up and gave this eloquent 18-minute speech, 11-minute speech. And she said, sorry for all of my notes, but these are my AP Gov notes from that day. And these young people have educated us all. They said, we will not be silent. They led the march on Washington, as well as sibling marches in 800 towns across the country and in solidarity around the world. And the media paid attention. And it's clearly only the beginning. But at the time of that march, and it's so important to again raise the story of what happened in Sacramento, because this continues to this day. There was another kind of gun violence, and it was police officers opening fire on an unarmed African-American man named Stefan Clark, and how important it is to raise those voices as well. The movements that grew up in this and last year, the Black Lives Matter movement, to deal with not only the killing of Stephon Clark, but in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, the announcement that there would not be indictment against the officers who killed Alton Sterling at point-blank range when he was on his back in a mall parking lot. All of these incidents of gun violence must be dealt with, must be the families, the communities, the movements must be given voice to. Which brings me back to, in these last few minutes, one of the great women of the civil rights movement, Rosa Parks. Last week, when we covered the anti-gun violence movement, the next day, the Democracy Now! team headed to the new Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. And I encourage everyone to go there, to take that journey from the basement in the slavery up to through Emmett Till and his casket um, to all that, to, cut to a museum that is, that extols the accomplishments of African Americans today. But we looked particularly at the story of Emmett Till and Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks, who December 1st, 1955, sits down on the bus in Montgomery, Alabama, refuses to get up for a white passenger. She's arrested. Four days later, she goes to court, December 5th, 1955, and the Montgomery Improvement Association is having its meeting, and they elect as their leader to challenge segregation in Alabama in the transportation system, a young minister who just moved into town, Dr. Martin Luther King. And within a year, this, uh, the segregation would fall as a result of the Supreme Court. The challenge would win. Dr. Martin Luther King was launched largely because of Rosa Parks' action. And it's always important to remember that. When Rosa Parks died, democracy now rushed down to Washington. She was the first African-American woman to lay in state in the Capitol Rotunda. And then her body was brought to a church in Washington, D.C. before the big funeral in Detroit. We couldn't even get inside the church, but it's often much more interesting to be outside, where thousands of people were with large loudspeakers as people like Oprah and Cicely Tyson remembered her. And I asked a young woman, I said, what are you doing here today? And she said, oh, she thought I had caught her out, sort of. She said, I emailed my professors, she said. I told them I'm going to get an education. <laughs> and people gathered to honor Rosa Parks. But I remember one of the networks saying, Rosa Parks was a tired seamstress. She was no troublemaker. 
And that's where they got it wrong. Rosa Parks was a first-class troublemaker. She knew exactly what she was doing. She didn't just sit down because she was tired, though she certainly was tired. She sat down because she was the secretary of the local NAACP. She worked with Edie Nixon. He was the president of the Montgomery NAACP. They had been challenging racist practices in the South for years. They knew exactly what they were doing. Rosa Parks was a first-class activist. The media denigrates activists, but what can be more noble than dedicating your life to making the world a better place? And to show how brave Rosa was, just a few months before, the summer of 1955 was the summer of Emmett Till, the summer of a 14-year-old African-American boy from Chicago. Her his mother, Mamie, sent him down to be in Money, Mississippi, to be with his aunt and uncle and his cousins just for the summer, to get out of the summer heat of Chicago. And he wasn't long there before he was ripped out of bed one night by a white mob. They tortured him, they lynched him, and he ended up in the bottom of the Tallahatchie River. They said he had wolf whistled at a white woman. When his body was dredged up, and sent back to Chicago, his mother's only child. She did something incredibly brave. She said she wanted the casket open for the wake and the funeral. She wanted the world to see the ravages of racism, the brutality of bigotry. And so thousands streamed by his casket, and then Jet Magazine and other black publications took photographs of his distended, mutilated head, and they were actually published. And they were seared into the history and consciousness of this country. Mamie Till had something very important to teach the press of today. Show the pictures. Show the images. And this is where I will end. Could you imagine for one week if the media simply showed the ravages of war? Whether we're talking about the US in Afghanistan, in Iraq, whether we're talking about the catastrophe that is what's happening in Yemen today. If we saw a baby dead on the ground and she was actually named and you learned about her parents, if we saw a woman with her legs blown off in a drone strike in Yemen, we learned who was getting married. She was part of a wedding party. Who had fallen in love? And we actually learned these stories. If on everyone's Facebook wall, if every tweet, if every email for a week talked about a soldier who is dead and dying for just one week, Americans are a compassionate people. They would say, no, war is not the answer to conflict in the 21st century. Democracy Now! <laughs>